Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Kathleen Gallagher Cunningham. I am the current president of the Peace Science Society International. It's my pleasure to host this event today. Uh, such a great uh, panel, such an important topic. Uh, I would like to start by thanking our hosts. Uh, we are hosted today by the Online Peace Science Society Colloquium. And I wanna give a special thanks to Jennifer Barnes, Brad Smith, and Chelsea Estencona, who have been uh, working tirelessly to put together this event. So I'll start with just a, a very brief statement about our topic of interest today. I'm sure many of you uh, are well familiar with, with what we're gonna be discussing uh, and give you just a little bit of my own perspective on uh, watching the last year unfold. I think for many of us, the 2022 full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine came as a surprise. The tension between Russia and the Ukraine, uh, which has been increasingly pro-Western was clear but the occurrence of a major war between states has become rare over time. So the scale of the invasion um, that has occurred and the sustained conflict is something that political scientists uh, in particular, I think we're quite surprised by, um, especially those of us that study uh, international conflict in a, in a more general uh, context. Uh, one year on, the UN reports that more than 13 million Ukrainians have been displaced, about a third of the pre-war population. Uh, estimates suggest that over 200,000 Russian troops have been killed or wounded in Ukraine, and more than 100,000 Ukrainian fighters uh, have been killed or wounded so far. The war seems to have strengthened ties between Ukraine and the West. Uh, we now see billions of dollars of aid flowing into Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky applied for NATO membership, although recent comments suggest that NATO is thinking about this as a longer term question. Uh, I think that's something that that'll be of interest to the group today. Um, we have a fantastic group of panelists uh, to reflect on this war. Uh, and what I wanna do before I hand it over to them is just uh, give a brief introduction to each of them. Uh, many of, of them, uh, the audience members probably already know. Uh, each is an expert in conflict um, and, and in this area, and I'm really looking forward to their perspectives today. Um, let me start with uh, Professor Jesse Driscoll. Uh, he's an associate professor at uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, his main research areas are comparative state building dynamics, uh, and he has a geographic focus on Russia and its neighbors. Um, he is author, co-author of numerous articles and books, including, uh, which may be of interest to um, people on the uh, workshop today, um, Warlords and Coalition Politics in Post-Soviet States um, and Ukraine's Unnamed War Before the Russian Invasion in 2022. We also have Professor Yuri Zukov, who is an Associate Professor um, in Political Science and a Research Associate Professor with the Center for Political Studies and the Institute for Social Research. University of Michigan. Uh, his research centers on the causes, dynamics, and legacies of armed conflict um, at the international and local levels. Uh, he is a developer and maintainer of the Violent Incident Information from News Articles Project, which I encourage you to take a look at. Um, this is near real-time violent event and territorial control tracking uh, for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We also joined by Professor Lise Howard. Uh, Lise is wearing uh, three professional hats this year. She serves as Professor of Government and Foreign Service at Georgetown University. She's a senior fellow in residence at the United States Institute of Peace, working with the Russian Ukraine team. And she is president of the Academic Council for the UN System. She's much busier than I am, I'll just say that. Uh, she studied Soviet constitutional law in um, the USSR in the 1990s. Uh, after the end of the Soviet Union, she shifted to research war termination and peacekeeping. And since Russia's war on Ukraine, uh, her career is coming full circle. And then finally, we're um, joined by Professor James Goldgeier. He is professional international relations at American University and currently a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Center on International Security and Cooperation, as well as a visiting fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at Brookings Institution. Uh, in addition to his many academic appointments, he's held a number of public policy positions, including director for Russian, Ukraine and Eurasian Affairs on the National Security Council staff. Uh, he has authored and co-authored uh, a number of books, including Power and Purpose, U.S. Policy Towards Russia After the Cold War, and 
not whether but when the US decision to enlarge NATO. Uh, as I'm sure you all agree, uh, we just have a fantastic panel of experts here and I look forward to hearing um, their takes on the last year of conflict um, in the Ukraine, uh, as well as their responses to questions that arise from this discussion. Um, why don't we go ahead then and start with um, Professor Jesse Driscoll, who will do our first presentation. It is entirely possible that Jesse has frozen as he did earlier in our testing uh, time here. So let me see if uh, Jennifer can help us with um, unsharing his screen and perhaps we will have Yuri, uh, Professor Yuri Zukov speak first. Sorry, Yuri, you're going to be called in quickly here, uh, out of order. That's all right. OK, I guess we'll start with the guns and bombs. Um, <laughs> right, so I'm going to try to provide an overview of the military dimension of this war, kind of give you a, a sense of some of the assumptions of the Russian military going into this war and how some of those assumptions did not really line up with the reality and how all this then affected the nature of military operations over the first year of the war. Uh, I'm also going to give you a little bit of a sit rep on, on the ongoing Russian military offensive uh, this winter and some of the prospects facing Ukraine's uh, offensive this spring. So throughout, I'm going to be uh, showing you maps from uh, the aforementioned uh, near real-time data project, which should be up on your screen right now. Um, and, uh, and so these are data on territorial control and violence from Vina, which uh, if any of you are interested in these data, you, they're freely available on my GitHub page. And so what you're seeing in front of you right now is just a time plot at the bottom showing the extent of Russia's territorial control over the conflict. And you can already see uh, that the front line has been remarkably static since about six weeks into this, into this war. And if we start right here on the, on the 23rd of February on the eve of the full-scale invasion, this is what the front line looked like for much of the first eight years of this conflict. Russia controlled about 7.5% of Ukraine's territory, including Crimea and uh, the so-called uh, Luhansk and the Donetsk People's Republics. And this was essentially a situation where we had static defensive battles, a lot of artillery duels, and the status quo was broadly seen as unsustainable. Uh, there was a military stalemate on the ground. Uh, the political resolution was governed by a Minsk II agreement, which neither side was implementing. And during the buildup, the Russian military build up in 2021, there was a lot of speculation over what Russia had planned to do, uh, whether it would be some kind of limited operation right here in the Donbass uh, to enforce Ukraine's compliance with the Minsk process, whether it would be a Kosovo style strike campaign intended to coerce Kyiv into making concessions, uh, or whether it would be a major ground invasion with the goal of partitioning or uh, enforcing regime change, kind of with a more limited uh, set of a uh, Objectives being to create a land bridge to Crimea over here, and a more uh, ambitious set of a uh, set of goals, in, uh, being uh, the annexation of all of Ukraine. And so we know now that Russia clearly opted for the most ambitious of these objectives, and this was a type of war for which uh, the Russian military was not prepared. Russia's political leadership had clearly been planning this war for many years, and it had gone to great lengths to prepare. The political battlefield domestically. Um, it was through an increasingly aggressive crackdown on freedom of the press and political opponents and NGOs. And um, throughout, it was creating these new legal instruments to silence dissent, and this years long propaganda effort to cast Ukrainians as Nazis, delegitimize Ukraine's uh, government, uh, and uh, this wall to wall myth making about World War II in the movies and TV shows, parades, and books. This is you see a militarism that was disguised as uh, basically historical remembrance. So the domestic political ba battlefield had been prepped for this protracted confrontation with not just Ukraine, but also NATO and the West. But Russia's army 
have for the last 15 years been organized around a very different type of mission. So in a series of reforms after the Russian-Georgian War of 2008, Russia tried to shift away from a Soviet-style mass mobilization model toward a, a smaller, more professional, more flexible force structure. Uh, these reforms were never completed. And as a result, Russia was left with a hybrid of these two systems. They had the smaller force of contract personnel that was well-suited for limited contingency operations, things like Syria or the Donbass in 2014. You know, these would be military operations against relatively weak opponents, light infantry, no heavy artillery, no armored vehicles, no anti-air defenses. And the Russian general staff's planning around Ukraine seemed to make similar set of assumptions about what a potential war against Ukraine would look like. It also did not help that commanders in the field were kept in the dark about these plans until several hours before the war started. So as we look at the first few days of this invasion, what we see is that this lack of preparation was pretty clear from how the Russian army operated. Um, the, the concept of operations here uh, was to advance in four main axes, uh, southern axis from Crimea through Kherson and uh, Zaporizhia, basically create this land bridge to Crimea and potentially all the way over to Odessa, a northern axis from Belarus to Kyiv to decapitate the Ukrainian government, also secondary northeast axis from Sumy and uh, Chernihiv uh, to kind of close this double embellishment of Kyiv over here. And there was also an eastern axis through Kharkiv to envelop uh, Ukrainian troops in the Donbass, uh, which had been occupying um, the static defensive position in the Joint Force Operations Area in the Donbass. And the goal was to basically close an encirclement of, of these forces and cut them off from uh, the rest of Ukraine's army in the West. And all this was to be supported by strikes against uh, Ukrainian command and control and anti-air defense systems. The problem was that the, the Russians had underestimated their opponent. They're moving in these large, long columns, as you all saw probably from the news, with exposed flanks. A lot of the elite units, like the VDV, paratroopers, and naval infantry were in the front. Tanks were moving without air cover uh, or infantry support. They were bypassing large cities like Sumy and Chernihiv. Um, and uh, this, this type of warfare really only makes sense if you're expecting minimal resistance. And more to the point, the Russians were not implementing their own combined arms doctrine. In the Russian military before the war, the primary combat unit capable of independent operations was a so so-called Battalion Tactical Group, or BTG. This is a combined arms task force with about 800 personnel. Uh, these are typically formed from motorized infantry or armor units with some support elements, some artillery, logistics, and anti-air defenses. This is how they were trained to fight, but this is not how they ended up fighting in this phase of the war. The BTGs immediately broke up into smaller units uh, without support. This allowed them to advance more quickly, but also made them a lot more vulnerable. And the Russians also made surprisingly little emphasis on suppressing Ukrainian anti-air defenses. For an operation like this, this is something that you would typically do as a step one. You want to establish air control before a strategic bombing campaign or a ground assault. But they were trying to do this simultaneously while a ground invasion was underway, when air assets were also needed to provide tactical you know, ground combat support. And as a result, a lot of Ukraine's Air Force and uh, anti-air de defense systems survived. And they're able to implement a pretty successful air, air denial strategy that made it very costly for Russian aircraft to operate in Ukraine's skies. And as we then zoom, zoom ahead over the next couple of weeks to about mid-March, we see that there are some parts of the front where this optimistic approach did succeed. So particularly in the south, the Russians broke through Ukrainian lines pretty quickly. Uh, they faced little organized resistance apart from a few pockets. Uh, they had local air superiority. They tried to advance you know, dozens of kilometers a day, and they succeeded for the most part. They forced a crossing of the Dnipro River relatively easily, around Kherson, heading into Mykolaiv Oblast. Um, this was the most slightly defended sector of the front, so this showed. But it was a very different situation in the north. So at the same time, the Ukrainian leadership adopted this defense in depth strategy. So rather than attempting to stop the Russians at the border, which it was already too late for that, they focused on defense of key cities like Kyiv, Kharkiv. And so they drew the Russians in, stretching out their supply lines. Uh, Russian artillery and combat service support elements got stuck in the roads way in the back where they faced constant ambushes by the Ukrainians. Uh, this left the Russians incapable of implementing any kind of combined arms warfare. It also left them overextended, unable to exploit breakthroughs in the front. 
unable to provide basic support or resupply for offensive operations. And the troops started taking huge losses. They were abandoning their vehicles. And so by mid-March, Russian forces in the north were no longer capable of conducting offensive operations. The ter territory that they held up here um, in the north was pretty much impossible to defend. They had these long salients along major roads. Um, so the decision was made right around this time to withdraw these units and regroup for a more targeted campaign to consolidate Russian positions in the east in the Donbass. And this early debacle had several consequences. So it freed up a lot of Ukrainian units. Uh, it allowed the Ukrainians to send reserves to reinforce defensive positions in the south. Um, so to stabilize the front in Mukhalaev and Saparizhia, where previously the Russians had operated with very little resistance. Uh, this also ensured the survival of Ukraine's anti-air defenses and the availability in part because of this availability of inexpensive short-range surface to air platforms, this ensured that the Russians could not replicate a serious style air campaign. So there was no carpet bombing of civilian centers, medium altitude with unguided munitions. This forced the Russians to rely a lot more on standoff systems like cruise missile strikes, which caused a lot less damage. And it also neutralized R Russians' uh, army aviation, helicopters, ground attack aircraft, which could not safely operate in theater due to this surface to air missile threat. And then Russian ground units had to operate essentially without air support for much of the rest of the war. This also convinced a lot of Western nations that Ukraine was not on the verge of collapse. It allowed them to dramatically increase the supply of, we of Western weapon systems. But perhaps most importantly, this absolutely crippled the Russian army's capacity for offensive operations for the remainder of the war. They experienced very heavy losses of personnel, armored vehicles. Many of the personnel lost were elite troops with the VDV, with naval infantry. These elite troops could not be easily replaced with untrained, mobilized personnel. And so as a result, the front line has been relatively static ever since. And if we look at the trends from here on out, the only significant ground that the Russians were able to gain you know, from April through the summer was in the Donbass, siege of Mariupol uh, down here, and also Lysychansk and Severodonetsk up here in, the, in Luhansk. Um, now, these towns were important from a logistical standpoint because they straddle a, a major railway that goes from north to south over here. It's a major supply route for the Russians. And both of these operations took months to complete. Um, Russia was expending about 20,000 artillery shells per day. Ukraine was expending around 6,000. Uh, by this point, they had, or had pretty much almost used up a stockpile of 152 millimeter Soviet standard shells. Uh, this is the older, more unreliable ammunition, and their ballistic accuracy is more limited. So you need to fire a lot more munitions to hit a target. Um, the same is true also for Russian artillery units, but the Russians just had a lot more guns and ammo. And uh, the Ukrainians also had no replacements for their barrels, so there was no domestic production. So this is also the time in which Ukrainians began to shift over to NATO standard 155 millimeter howitzers. Uh, this is a period in which the HIMARS rocket artillery began to arrive in Ukraine in large numbers, uh, uh, allowing the Ukrainians to strike Russian ammunition depots behind the front lines. And this limited the Russians' ability to maintain this high rate of fire. And so by the time that the Russians actually captured these cities, and we should chance consider Donetsk by early July, uh, the Russians were exhausted. And no significant new efforts had then occurred until August. And at this point, the Russians are also experiencing very serious manpower shortages. Up until the fall, they're using half measures short of mobilization. They're offering generous combat pay for short service contracts. They're forming these reserve battalions, relying heavily on force providers from outside the regular armed forces, internal troops, riot police, mercenaries, uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk people's militias. And this predictably resulted in some auxiliary forces having very low troop quality. It also allowed the Russians to partially make up for their numerical disadvantages. And it also solved uh, this political problem of fighting a large scale war with the peacetime military. But all of this you know, uh, completely collapsed in the beginning of September with Ukraine's uh, high cape counteroffensive. Now this uh, counteroffensive exposed the limitations of the Russian approach. So over a week in early September, Ukraine managed to liberate most of Kharkiv Oblast up here, uh, including key cities of Izum and Kupiansk, uh, which is this dot right here, uh, 
which straddles uh, a key rail junction that was very important for Russia's supply lines. And by early October, Ukraine had managed to reach the uh, administrative border of Luhansk Oblast. There are several reasons for why this offensive was so successful, mainly that uh, the Russians had redeployed thousands of troops to the south, expecting the main Ukrainian effort to be in Kherson over here. Um, this left second tier, third tier forces manning the lines in, uh, in Kharkiv. Uh, and also the Russians could not get reserves to these areas in time uh, to meet the Ukrainian offensive. There are also some intel failures. Uh, the Russians apparently expected the Ukrainian advance to come from the south, not from the north. And there are also more general problems of command and control on the Russian side. There was no unified theater command. Lower echelon commanders were afraid to communicate bad news up the chain. This included info about how dire the situation was, about the need for reinforcements, about the quality of their kit, about the ratio of friendly and enemy losses. And the result was a lot of false optimism. Uh, was it also exacerbated supply failures because this terrain over here was problematic for resupply. Only three available river crossings here. And over the previous month, the Ukrainians uh, had been actively destroying ammunition depots behind Russian lines. So then as we move ahead to the next main development, which is around Kherson down here. And now this was a, a very different story because uh, Ukraine was advancing on Kherson from multiple directions, but these were not as lightly defended positions on the Russian side as they were in, in Kharkiv. Um, Ukraine had taken out the bridge crossing that Russians were using to supply the garrison of the city, but their actual ground advances from the west, from Mykolaiv on the M14 highway, and uh, from the north, from David of Brod, um, which was about twice as far, there were, Ukrainians were taking very heavy losses, and uh, the Russians were actually able to hold the Ukrainians off, buying themselves time for an organized withdrawal there were, throughout all this, there were inflicting very heavy losses on the Ukrainians. Um, and then eventually, by the time that the Russians withdrew from uh, Kherson, they had, at this point, fallen back to a more defensive posture, this campaign of cruise missile strikes against critical infrastructure, digging fortifications, stabilizing the front. And the front line then remained relatively static on, until January, which brings us to essentially where we are today, uh, Russia's new uh, winter offensive. Um, and this, uh, this offensive started a, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's been mostly limited to the Donbass. Um, and the basic co concept of operations here is to execute a double envelopment um, of Ukrainian positions in the Donbass uh, with, with one, uh, one axis coming down uh, from uh, Kremina up here at the, at the border of Luhansk and, and Kharkiv. Secondary axis coming up from Vugledar in the south. Uh, so Vugledar down here sits on a critical railroad, which can be used to link Russian units down here in, in the south from bases in, in the Rostov. Um, and this is also coupled with some possible diversionary actions for the north. Um, but the main effort is very much centered right here about Svatova and Kremina, um, also to pin down Ukrainian units in uh, Bakhmut over here. Um, they're attempting to break through Ukrainian lines. So the thing to keep in mind right now is that the absolute majority of the Russian military is already committed in Ukraine. Russia has committed a large majority of the Western military district's conventional elements uh, to the Svatova Kamina line over here. Uh, most of the available maneuver elements of other military districts and the airborne forces are also committed. Uh, Russia currently lacks sufficient uncommitted reserves to dramatically increase the scale or intensity of this offensive. Um, and the very limited theater reserves available for commitment. Um, and so this means that what we're seeing right now is pretty much going to be the extent of the offensive moving forward. They might make some incremental gains here and there. Uh, but there are some key challenges facing uh, Russia's winter offensive here. First is that they're struggling to replace losses, uh, especially equipment like tanks. There have been several critical and elite Russian tank units, the mechanized formations that suffered devastating losses earlier on in the war. Um, so they lost between a third and half of their pre-war tank fleet over the first year, about three times as many armored vehicles they lost as the Ukrainians. There were many reasons for this. You know, these tanks moving in long columns without combat air support and protection from infantry did not help. Um, it also allowed Ukrainian anti-tank anti crews to get close. Um, and so rebuilding entire tank regiments from scratch, which is what the Russians are trying to do, I mean, this requires hundreds of tanks that the Russians do not have in usable condition. And they're not able to 
produce them quickly enough. And the amount they can produce in the near term is a fraction of what they are losing right now. And reports from Buhidar down here are, are that they have not learned their lesson. Uh, tanks and armored personnel carriers are moving in long columns. Um, Ukrainian forces are ambushing them off the roads into mine shoulders, and then the vehicles are disabled by the mines. Column loses, loses mobility, and then the Ukrainians target these static columns with artillery. And, um, and uh, as, as we look ahead to the prospects for um, you know, how this, this offense is likely to unfold, um, Russia right now has a lot of relatively untrained manpower that they're attempting to use in, for offensive operations with insufficient equipment without armored vehicle support. Uh, and we're seeing this increased reliance on human wave attacks, also these small unit assault tactics uh, where they're trying to uh, draw enemy fire, expose Ukrainian positions, and then cover those positions with artillery fire. The problem is that the Russian army is not optimized for this kind of warfare. This requires delegating initiative to a lot of junior officers, the squad, squad leaders, rapid decision cycles. The Russians do not have that. Um, even if they get better at this, widespread tank losses and ammunition shortages are going to limit defensive potential here. Um, and so I think what we're seeing right now is, is pretty much the extent of it. Um, and, uh, and if we look forward to Ukraine's counteroffensive, the next shooter drop is going to be the spring offensive from Ukraine, which uh, there are several things to watch for here. So as Ukraine gains access to longer sh these longer range strike systems like HIMARS, ATACMS, uh, Army tactical missile systems, they can put Crimean uh, you know, <clears throat> lines of communication at more direct threat over here. They can potentially cut off the entire grouping of Russian forces uh, in the south from the supply lines coming through Crimea, which is also why Vugidar is so critically important for the Russians. Um, and we can also discern Ukraine's intent from the weapon systems that they're scheduled to receive. You know, these several hundred armored personnel carriers, seven, several dozen tanks, this suggests that they're planning to break through and drive deep behind Russian lines in Southern Asia. Russians are aware of this, which is why they've spent the last several months digging in and building multiple lines of fortifications, sending uh, tens of thousands of mobilized personnel. And, and there's already a lot of signs of trouble on the Russian side, uh, a lot of shell hunger, uh, actually on both sides. They're expending ammunition at unsustainable rates. And the thing I'll leave you with right now is that right now we are in a war of attrition, as you can see by the, the static front line and the way it's looked for much of the last few months. Uh, and in a war of attrition, you know, artillery duels and positional, positional battles, victory requires simply inflicting more losses than the enemy is able to replace. Uh, to, to destroy personnel and equipment faster than the enemy is able to send reinforcements and resupply. So a few delayed shipments of critical armaments may tip the scales here. So this kind of long war that we're clearly in right now is going to test the West commitment to Ukraine's defense and its ability to reclaim its territory. And Russia's goal moving forward will be to exploit Western diplomatic and political disagreements and really disrupt the flow and timeliness of aid. So the political front, I think, moving forward will be the one to watch, much more so, I think, even more so than the military one that you see here. So I apologize for going over time and um, yeah, we'll turn, that out, turn things over to my fellow panelists. Great. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I believe we have uh, Professor Jesse Driscoll back, and I think uh, Jennifer is going to start the slides for you. Okay, uh, can people see the slides? Easy enough. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'll try to uh, and I apologize for the technical problems on my side. Uh, I'll try to uh, go as quickly as I can to make up time. Um, and I, I think it actually makes sense for me to go after Yuri, because um, I really am going to agree with everything that he said, but just amplify a couple of small points. Um, my task was to speak about the background leading up to the war. I've just completed a book on this subject, co-authored with Dominique Arell. He's the chair of Ukrainian studies at the University of Ottawa. Um, we cite a lot of Ukrainian sources, hardly any Russian sources. Um, of course, it, the book is in English and um, it's a scintillating read. So if you're interested in knowing more about um, the background to this conflict, um, the, our, our book stops on February 24th, 2022. It is, it is a history book, um, but hopefully one that's not completely overtaken by events. Um, and I know that on this panel, there are gonna be a lot of folks that have different uh, like levels of background on Ukraine. And some people are coming at it from more of a top-down IR perspective, others a bottom-up 
um, micro conflict perspective. And so it's it's almost impossible to know what I am supposed to do with um, 15 minutes or 10 now um, to give you relevant background. Uh, but I will direct you, for those of you who are interested in deep history, um, type the words Timothy Snyder Yale Ukraine into Google, and you will find um, about 30 hours of really high quality content on the history of Ukraine. It's great back, background commute writing. Um, you'll just learn an awful lot listening to um, Tim Snyder. He's a serious historian who's doing, I think, uh, very serious work on trying to provide a more complete kind of answer than you can get in 10 minutes. So I want to plug that. But, you know, as, as, as they say in the DOD, everyone needs a bottom line up front, and this requires making some psychological claims about people who we don't have direct data on. Um, this is not, by the way, the question that our book sets out to answer, but I want to make sure that, that I answer it. Um, we think that the real problem is that Russia and Russians in the Kremlin did not believe that the status quo was sustainable prior to February 24th. Um, this amplifies a point made by Yuri, but I'm going to try to unpack it a little bit um, over the next few minutes. So uh, this is a slide that lays out some of the scaffolding of international law. You could add more rows here. You could talk about the Genocide Convention or the Helsinki Accords. The only thing I want to focus on in the interest of our time is the upper right cell, which is full only for the UN Security Council. Uh, Russian diplomatic uh, positions in the lead up to this war have been uh, quite consistent, cynical, but consistent in a way that drives conflict resolution towards the Minsk settlement. And there is a UN um, statement on that. Getting anything else through the UN Security Council is very difficult because the Russian narrative of this conflict going back to 2014 and the uh, Anglophone and Francophone and, and Chinese uh, version of this conflict are, are so distant from one another, it's difficult to get them to agree on very much of anything. So once something hits the UN Security Council, it stalls. The OSCE is a consensus organization. It has the same problem, except Ukraine is a member. So Ukraine and Russia just vetoing each other's resolutions you know, is, is, is a serious thing. And so you know, for that reason, a, a lot of people who were Ukraine observers could imagine this just going on and on and on uh, until maybe you know, sometime in the, in the distant future, 2035, 2045, um, a, a frozen conflict of the sort that we see in the, the South Caucasus. Um, and that's easy to understand. If you want to understand things from the bottom up, not the top down, if you want to understand Ukrainian adaptations to Russia having troops on its territory, I'm afraid things get much more complicated um, and I'm not going to try to unpack this in the short time that I have, but this is the, the engine, this is what's going on under the hood of the book that Dominique and I wrote, where we're basically interested in talking about uh, Russian speakers, people who have the ability to identify themselves as either Russians or Ukrainians who speak Russian at home, but are trying to respond politically to the um, uh, Russian behavior. And it's a story about how Russian threats of violence and then actual violence have shaped Ukrainian politics since independence. We talk a lot about the 1990s, uh, but the bulk of the book is Maidan and the, the, the things that happened after Maidan, where you have actualized violence, um, an aggression, an invasion. Uh, how much of it is Russian astroturf and how much of it is grassroots is, of course, a source of great emotion and debate. But if you want to um, see the empirics on that, um, that those bottom-up adaptations, it's, 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 a, it's a constructivist account with a lot of mechanisms, but that's kind of what's in our book. The bottom line again, however, for this tasking is that I think a lot of Russians believed when they signed the Minsk Accords in 2014 and then 2015 Minsk II after the Battle of Debeltsove, that time would be on their side and that they would be able to continue to grind out changes in Ukrainian domestic politics that would be in Russia's interest over the long term. And I think that was their theory of, of victory, essentially by exhaustion, um, because of the combination of different um, things in international law. Now, um, as, as a military analyst that I, I like quite a lot, 
mentioned, this wasn't exactly Putin's best four dimensional chess move. So this is a heat map of Zelensky's votes in 2019. And I, you know, you can easily eyeball the DNR, LNR separatist territories and Crimea. It turns out when you remove the territory, which is most um, likely to vote for the party of regions algebraically before any of the complicated constructivist mechanisms that we talk about, there's just not enough votes to get a, um, a pro-Russia median voter. Um, for a good paper on that, I would recommend the work of my colleague Paul Denari at Riverside. Um, impossible to misunderstand, very tight little paper that just lays that out. But you know, the bottom line is that what this means when you think through changes is that even though you have a lot more people voting in the East, you also have uh, statues of Catherine the Great getting torn down all over the country. This is, of course, going to be supercharged and amplified by rally around the flag dynamics of the war. Um, this particular statue being taken down, this picture was taken from December. Obviously, it's going to be coded as wartime behavior and reasonably so. But this sort of thing had been going on for quite some time prior to February 24th. I can get myself in a little bit of trouble by putting slides like this up on the internet because it seems like making arguments like this lends to suspicion that I am blaming the victim somehow. That is not the case. But it is factually true that there have been adaptations taking place within Ukrainian society, constructivist changes, where many Russian-speaking Ukrainians are now identifying, sometimes on surveys, sometimes on censuses, sometimes just in terms of where they kids send their kids to school and what they say to their kids in school, identifying more with a Ukrainian national narrative than with a Russian narrative, even if they do it while speaking Russian at home. This is something that um, then is decoded, apparently, by Vladimir Putin as, um, uh, I mean, he uses the word genocide. And you don't have to uh, take that seriously. I'm not trying to amplify that particular propaganda point. But in terms of what the man actually says, um, to the extent that we want to give him the time of day, these adaptations by Ukrainians are what was not sustainable about the status quo. Now, all of that might just be cover for other motives. And I want to really make sure that I end by amplifying that point. Timofey Milovanov was at Northwestern University a couple days ago, and he made a point that I want to actually make sure that I end with as well, which is to say that it takes no effort at all to come up with six or seven or eight completely consistent and plausible accounts of why Vladimir Putin did what he did. And so the fact that Dominique and I just wrote a book about, you know, a snail's eye view of what took place community by community in Ukraine is not the last word on this at all. If you go read Man's State and War, right there waiting for you on page 15 is a clear statement that it's not a horse race, right? All three images matter. And so there is good work to be done in terms of thinking about what's going on inside the head of Vladimir Putin or what incentives are created by the regime that he has created. I think um, I think Mike McFall's statement that Putinism depends on the generation of external threats for its own domestic legitimacy and the new social contract is spot on. And a lot of what you can understand about this conflict is well understood through that lens. Everything Yuri was talking about, about military failures on the Russian side, it, it can, is also worth understanding. These are second image arguments that I take a lot more seriously, having spent a little bit of time working on this problem set than I did before. The work of Caitlin Talmadge doesn't talk about Russia specifically, but the intelligence failures, the logistics failures, are clearly, I think, a result of Russia lying to itself about its own military capability over and over and over again. And I think when I think that creates a more complete version of the military um, expectation that they would be able to just remove the tippy top of the pyramid, kill a couple people in Kiev and have a new government there. I mean, I think that that is a, um, an intelligence failure. I think it's also a deeper colonial mindset of really not being able to believe that a Ukrainian state is there. And both of those are fundamentally second image arguments even if you're mass psychologizing a lot of people. They're valuable second image arguments. Finally, there's a whole bunch of very familiar third image arguments. I'm not going to recite them here chapter and verse. I think that they're probably familiar to most of the people who are watching, but there are um, security dilemma type arguments, which if you take them too far, 
um, can put you in a position of arguing that poor little Russia just wanted to be left alone. And I don't think that it's valuable to spend our time doing that kind of thing here. But these arguments are quite powerful, arguments about commitment and the inability of the West to commit to not um, uh, wanting more influence in Ukraine and the inability of Russia to commit to not wanting more influence in Ukraine. Um, and you can take, uh, it doesn't take much work. It takes two and a half pages to put together a very simple model of those sort of third image arguments where you're bargaining over Ukraine as an object. The disadvantage of relying solely on those models is that it emits Ukrainian voices and the idea that we're going to be able to somehow get a settlement to this conflict over the heads of 40 million Ukrainians seems absurd to me. So you might have to, at some point, if you're interested in conflict resolution, educate yourself a little bit about what took place in the lead up to this war. And if you're interested in an English language um, first draft of some, of some of those arguments and some of those facts, um, uh, there's a commercial product that you can, that you can buy. So um, with that, um, any of you are also, please feel free to just email me if all you want is the third image. Um, it's, it's two and a half pages long and I'll send you the PDF. It takes about 25 minutes to teach on a whiteboard. And it's an existence proof of how easy it is to just, as an American, imagine how to bargain with Russia without, without mentioning a single thing that Yuri talked about. None of those specific second image variables, no, you have to pronounce any Ukrainian cities. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can just talk about it as a bargaining game between Russia and the United States. That's certainly how Russia likes to talk about it. Thank you very much. Neat. Thank you, Jesse. Um, we have next um, Professor James Golgeyer. Great, thanks so much. Great pleasure to be here with everybody. Um, I was asked to talk about the implications of the war for NATO. Uh, and there are huge implications of the war for NATO. Uh, I'll focus just on three dimensions. Uh, first of all, NATO's impressive unity of response under American leadership, uh, NATO's supplying of the war effort for Ukraine, um, and then I'll spend most of the time on the challenges for the future within NATO, which are quite significant, I think. Um, but I would just suggest that if there was anything this administration would have been prepared for, it was leading the transatlantic community. Um, I, it might not have looked that way in 2021. You had the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan and lots of complaints from allies of consultation. You had the clumsy rollout of the AUKUS sub deal, the US, Australia, UK deal that left the French fuming. Uh, but there's no question that the administration with lots of time to prepare for February 24th, they knew from the fall that this was coming. Uh, and they had lots of time to prepare and they were prepared. Uh, on February 24th to uh, to lead the alliance, to lead NATO, to respond to this um, absolutely brutal and unprovoked expansion of Russia's war against Ukraine. You have a president who spent decades, senator, vice president, and now president, uh, working on foreign policy issues, knew the transatlantic community well, spent a lot of time working on NATO issues, uh, as has his team. Um, and their familiarity with US, Europe, Russia issues made a huge difference, uh, especially compared to his predecessor, who I think would have been completely unprepared uh, to deal with something like what has occurred over the past year. Um, Putin, uh, you know, uh, Jesse talked about uh, Putin um, believing that this was easy, Yuri as well. Uh, and they may have believed in part that that would be because the West would be divided. Um, and the West has been united. Uh, and even with countries in NATO like Hungary and Turkey that could have been expected to create more problems for a consensus-based organization, you've had a tremendous unity of response. Um, you know, I expected when this war broke out uh, or the expanded war uh, occurred on February 24th, expected tough sanctions. Um, I didn't see the freezing of Russian central bank assets coming. Uh, I think you know that was an, an incredible move uh, by the United States and its partners. Um, expected that there would be assistance, uh, but uh, not of this level. Um, for the United States to have committed uh, 47 billion uh, in, in uh, military assistance is, is just incredible. Um, uh, and of course, the what's being provided by the United States and its partners 
has gotten steadily more lethal. Uh, you know, already, you know, Yuri mentioned uh, the high Mars. Uh, you know, then we, you know, we've got the air, have, the, have had the air defense systems, uh, the Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, you know, then more recently, the tank discussion, the leopards uh, from Europeans and uh, down the road, the M1 Abrams from the United States. And of course, now there's discussion about fighter aircraft. Um, we don't know many of the details about intelligence assistance, but clearly there's been a lot of intelligence assistance um, that has, uh, and some of that, there has been some public reporting on that. So you have unity of purpose, um, and that uh, continues with a recognition that the time has not been ripe for serious negotiations, and happy to talk more about that. Um, uh, and and really remarkable, a wide array of support for a country that is a NATO partner, but is not a NATO member. And I, I think it's, you know, even more impressive, given that Ukraine is not a NATO member. If it were a NATO member, NATO would be directly involved militarily. Uh, although if it were a NATO member, uh, I don't think Putin would have attacked. So there is that as well. Um, but to do what NATO's done for a non-member uh, demonstrates that allies do understand what is at stake. Um, but there are huge challenges going forward that are going to reveal the different attitudes in NATO toward Russia, how to deal with Russia long term, and how to support Ukraine long term. Um, all these things are going to provide potential, uh, the potential for divisions within NATO that we have not seen in this first year. And you know, that potential will grow. Yuri talked about and showed you that map, that war of attrition, that line, you know, sort of settling in. Um, that is going to, I think, make a difference over time. But if you think about the within NATO uh, types of, of approaches, you've got the Baltic countries and Poland, the Eastern members, the frontline states. I mean, they've been trying to warn allies for years about how dangerous Russia is. Uh, and of course, they're going to continue to do so. The idea of having some kind of um, engagement with Russia, um, when you look at it from their standpoint, seems um, extremely, uh, uh, extremely dangerous. Um, but then you have the French and the Germans uh, who have wanted to find ways to engage Russia. You still have Macron talking about that, thinking about how to sort of build a, a European security order with Russia after this war. Um, they're going to continue to uh, think that way. I think the United States is probably somewhere in between. Um, I think the United States clearly recognizes that the only realistic policy toward Russia, uh, as long as Putin is in power anyway, uh, is containment, uh, is trying to contain Russian aggression, trying to ensure uh, that Russia does lose this war and also that Russia does not uh, even think about aggression toward the NATO member states. But for the United States, um, it is the case that on some issues like nuclear arms control, uh, both sides continue to have an interest in engagement. And even with what has occurred in the last couple of months, the United States pointing to uh, Russian violations of the New START treaty because they uh, blocked inspections and then the Russians deciding that they would just announce that the treaty has been suspended, um, the, the challenges of, of extending a treaty that expires in 2026. I mean, it's a very dangerous situation with respect to nuclear arms control. Uh, and both sides will, I think both sides will continue to have an interest in engagement on those issues. But of course, um, during this war, uh, that's pretty difficult to do. Um, you know, if there's anything NATO's good at, uh, its its history uh, is, uh, you know, one of containing Russian aggression. Uh, but as in the Cold War, there will be countries wanting to explore ways of trying to establish a different type of relationship with Russia and bringing Russia closer. But as that conversation emerges, um, you know, particularly as the war goes on and particularly as people are trying to think about if, you know, there is a post-war period. Uh, I, I think this, we we may well be facing a war that doesn't end in the sense that, you know, there is not going to be complete victory by one side or the other. There's not going to be a peace settlement, in my view. 
Um, and so, you know, there will be a state of war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, but that means you have to have a long-term policy toward Ukraine and a long-term policy toward Russia. Um, and I think as we think about that, we know more than we did before. Um, we knew, for example, in the transition from the Soviet era to the post-Soviet era, uh, that Russia, Russian imperialism was going to be a problem. Um, but I don't think we really fully understood how much. I would argue we really, for a lot of people, we didn't fully understand how much until February 24th of last year. The mantra 30 years ago from the West uh, was that a stable European security order could only be built with Russia. Um, and now it seems that a stable European security order can only be built without Russia. Uh, but would such an order really be stable? The problem is the values that underpin the EU and NATO are incompatible with a Russia that is not content to live within its 1991 internationally recognized borders. Uh, you know, my view, that's a big enough country, but apparently for uh, many Russians and particularly for Vladimir Putin, um, it's not in fact big enough because they think that other territories belong to it. The war started because Putin decided to act on these imperial designs. Um, it won't end until Russia gives up those imperial designs. It would have to give up the idea that territory that's Ukrainian belongs to it. Uh, and I don't think we really will have stability in Europe unless and until Russia becomes a post-imperial state. Last spring, Secretary of Defense Austin suggested that we wanted to weaken Russian militarily so that it couldn't do this again. Um, that is an approach that's basically saying we would like to force Russia to be post-imperial by preventing it from being able to do this type of uh, aggression again. But that's going to require continual effort. Um, the West has done a great job helping Ukraine uh, survive uh, to this point. It's extraordinary what the Ukrainians have done with the Western support uh, in order to push back the, West, the Russian aggression, as Yuri showed on the map. Um, whether the unity can last, whether Russia can finally shed these imperial designs are still open question. And then there's finally Ukraine's future with the West and Ukraine's future relationship with NATO. It is a EU candidate, uh, has EU candidacy for membership. Hopefully down the road, it will become an EU member. I still think NATO membership, which was unlikely before, remains unlikely and will be unlikely in the future. But I think what we will see is that the United States, with its NATO partners, making a security commitment to Ukraine to provide it with what it needs to defend itself against future Russian aggression. But to do that requires an incredibly long-term commitment. And just from the U.S. side, think about the U.S. politics right now. Think about, you know, where we are in terms of, you know, a House that's now Republican, um, a Senate and a presidency that are Democratic. We don't know what will happen in the presidential election in, in 2024. Um, can the United States maintain a long-term commitment to Ukraine and really ensure that it can defend itself in the face of Russian aggression? I think it's an open question. I hope that there, there has been bipartisan support for the defense of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I think things like Senator McConnell's visit to the Munich Security Conference to show uh, that Republicans uh, do support this effort to uh, help Ukraine defend itself. These are incredibly important, but there is a lot of work remain that remains to be done, especially if this war uh, goes on for a long time. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jim. Uh, and next we have Professor Lise Howard. Thanks so much, Kathleen, and thanks everybody for your excellent presentation so far and to everyone in the, off in the audience who's listening to us now. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm serving at the U.S. Institute of Peace this year on the Russia-Ukraine team. So I'm seeing um, a lot of what Jim has been talking about from the inside. Uh, uh, and I would actually agree with everybody who's come before me on pretty much everything, but I, I was asked to talk about something slightly different. So um, thinking about war termination in the long term, um, I want to talk for a moment about norms, laws, and institutions governing war 
and war termination, historical trends in Europe and Russian history that Jim just covered to a certain extent, and so did Jesse, um, and then varieties of war outcomes. So we have um, in international relations these key concepts, right? Norms, laws, and institutions. They're, they're, they're concepts, but they also act in the real world. Norms are expectations about appropriate behavior, um, rules established by treaty in international law, and then institutions that, that uphold these things and adjudicate disputes. So Russia's assault on Ukraine, it, it, I know I would imagine that there are quite a few people, and then I've seen a bit in the chat also, that, that argue, you know, and, and in international relations, that NATO's expansion um, was aggressive. I, uh, NATO's expansion was undiplomatic, and perceived often in Russia as aggressive, but it doesn't come near Russia's response to that expansion. I mean, Russia has violated every norm and law uh, as it pertains to war during this conflict. So it's committed interstate aggression, you said Bellum, um, violated the norms of war while you're conducting war, you know, committing war crimes during war, crimes against humanity, and now there are also charges of genocide, especially as it relates to children being removed from homes, thousands of children being removed from Ukraine and re-educated in Russia. And we have, as our, my prior um, panelists have noted, we have institutions, the UN, uh, Security Council, the OSCE, haven't been able to react, um, which is a break with recent history because we have many studies that demonstrate that interstate war was nearly dead, as Kathleen mentioned at the very beginning. We had very, very few wars between states and lots of books that looked at this phenomenon of, of the demise of interstate war since World War II. It's really quite striking. I'll just show one graph from the internationalist book. Um, if we think about uh, millions of square kilometers um, being conquered, um, there was a norm this is as far back as the data goes, there was a norm that it was okay to conquer territory and seize land. And then we had a shift um, moving from, so it was both a norm and it was common. And we had a shift around here that it became um, common, but less acceptable, illegal. And then we have by the end of World War II, very few, very few instances of, of, the, of the pursuit of territorial conquest and certainly um, the recognition of territorial conquest. So it's an interesting historical trend that we just, territorial conquest is not something that's been happening anymore. The UCDP data, um, this is just a plot that shows um, a similar trend since 1946, right? So we see um, by overall type of war, uh, the colonial wars in the red line, and they'll stop with the end of colonialism. Civil wars, you know, the peak around um, the end of the Cold War and then decline, uh, often related to peacekeeping. There's been a lot of work on, on trying to get at this decline. But then wars between states, you know, a maximum of six or something, five at any, in any given year, but just very, very few wars between states. So this war is is anachronistic, uh, as as people have mentioned before. It's anachronistic both in the type of interstate war, but also in its pursuits um, as an imperial war. So there were lots of com European colonial empires. If we think back in colonial history, uh, uh, just on the European continent, from the Swedish Empire to the Bulgarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungarian, French. United Kingdom, uh, the Prussian Empire, all of those empires relinquished the norm of imperial conflict, conquest and violence as a regular and expected a, 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 an appropriate way to settle disputes, territorial disputes. And this norm was enforced by international law, regulated by the UN Security Council as the highest authority governing the legitimacy of the use of force. We have the Soviet Union testing those norms and laws and with a little pushback in Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia and, uh, sorry, that should say Hungary in 56, not 65, that was in 56 um, and Czechoslovakia in 68. 
And then more recently, we have Russian Federation interventions in Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, um, the first iteration, and then the most recent. And there's a question in the chat about Georgia. I mean, the, the Georgian government is pro-Russian now, so Russia doesn't have to invade. Just like Belarus, Russia doesn't have to use force to influence the government because they already have control over those governments. Um, but Russian's imperial idea is key to Putin's position. And I will, I will just note, since we were bringing up imperialism a moment ago, when I was studying in the Soviet Union, I, I, so I, Kathleen mentioned I was studying Soviet constitutional law in the Soviet Union. And I visited Ukraine in the fall of 1991. And I, um, I visited Kiev, you know, there was no food, we we're experiencing complete economic collapse. I'm living in Leningrad where there's, there hasn't been any sugar in months because when Ukraine seceded, um, the sugar supply that all the sugar was being was being was grown in Ukraine, and there wasn't any more sugar in, in a lot of in a lot of the rest of of Russia, of uh, I shouldn't say the rest of Russia, a lot of the rest of the Soviet Union. But so I wrote a postcard to my mom, um, which I found a little while ago, that said, you know, I'm here in Ukraine, and these Ukrainians. You know, they really want independence. There's this big independence movement, but I think it would be a bad idea economically and spiritually. I I drunk I drunk the Russian Kool-Aid <laughs> that Ukraine didn't deserve independence. And this was a, just a common frame, not just among Russians. It was uh, not just among the Russian elite. It was also among you know I, there are five of us in graduate school at that time in Leningrad. Um, um, among Americans who, who were living in that society that it was appropriate, the imperial idea was justified. Um, so just, just to say that, that that is the idea that needs to die. I would agree with both Jesse and Jim. Um, we have some shit, I'm not gonna talk about this slide because I want us to move on, but, but just to note that in Russian history, Defeats in war have led to political changes, and it there have been drastic changes in political leadership in Russia. I feel like there are some people say you know, Russia has always been autocratic, and it's always going to be this way. It's always going to be imperial. Well, all of Europe was imperial until it wasn't, and Russia has been has actually changed quite a bit over time in styles and forms of leadership. Not so much democratic, but it's it, it, there is capacity for change. Um, shifting now to think about varieties of war, possible war outcomes. I'll just note that there have been so few interstate war outcomes that it's hard to categorize them. It's hard to say that there's been any trend in interstate war termination since 1945, 1946, because there have been so few of that type. Um, I will say that there are still a lot of militarized interstate disputes. Um, almost every country in the world well, not every, but many, many countries in the world have have border disputes. And since 1946, there are, there were 50 times that border dis disputes started to escalate to violence. They went to the UN Security Council for adjudication. So the Security Council took some measure, right, Re referral to the International Court of Justice, or they made some kind of decision, or we, they sent peacekeepers, or there was a mediator, and those disputes de-escalated. So only a handful of militarized inter interstate disputes have escalated to violence. And there is this pattern of the UN Security Council um, de serving to de-escalate disputes. It's anyway, so I'll just throw that one out there. In terms of looking at Russia and Ukraine, um, I'm, I'm working this year on the war termination team at USIP. So we spend a lot of time thinking about this. If we think, and, and I will also just say there is an infinite number of ways in which this war could end. But I think you can sort of boil it down to a, a two by two. So one ending is where Ukraine achieves minimal goals or maximal goals, Russia achieves minimal or maximal. We're now in a small scale or a smaller scale war of attrition, um, which could lead to a draw and negotiations. I will just reiterate what Jesse has said, which is that um, Putin has violated 
that every time he's made an agreement, he's violated it. So uh, Ukraine's borders, Ukraine was, um, was given voting rights in the UN in 1945 because Stalin wanted Ukraine, Stalin wanted some extra votes, right? So the, the UN has actually recognized Ukraine as a voting member since 1945. Its borders were recognized upon independence in 1991. We have the, the Budapest Agreement of 1994, um, uh, when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and the US said that it would guarantee Ukraine's security in return for giving up nuclear weapons. The 2004 Agreement on Ukraine's Borders, um, Minsk I and Minsk II, Putin has violated all of these agreements. So to expect that you can negotiate with Putin now, much as I would love to, that is kind of the definition of insanity, negotiating, inspecting a different outcome. So where does that leave us? Um, another possibility is Russian victory. Russia obtains its goals. Jim was talking about the, the East European powers where Germany and Russia, uh, where Germany and France sit uh, on this matter. Uh, I think for Russia to achieve its goals in Ukraine, I, 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 uh, in every conversation I've had, it's, it's difficult for people to imagine Russia achieving its goals because of the threat that would pose, not only to the former Soviet states, but also to NATO. And so there, I, I think, that, that even, even if Trump gets reelected, and even if, even if, you know, you can think about all sorts of things that could change, um, uh, I think there would still be an interest, a deep interest in Europe uh, in stopping Russia's advance if Russia were to militarily um, gain control over Ukraine. Another option is Ukraine victory. As, as we see from, from Yuri's slides, that seems a bit off. U Ukrainian victory is, is defined by Ukraine taking back its borders from 1991. Or we could of course have a large scale war. Um, wars like this in, in large part, as we know from history, depend on allies. And if China sides with Russia and starts supplying Russia in this war, we could see a, a fairly quick escalation um, with NATO countering um, and, and escalation. So uh, I'm, I'm of the mind that we're in this terrain right now, unfortunately. So how the war, of course the war depends, how it ends depends in part on domestic coalitions, but um, it, at the end of the day, it will depend uh, domestic coalitions within Russia and within Ukraine. There was a question in the chat about what's going on in Russia. I I listen to, I listen to the opposition news and Yuri Dut and and so I have a kind of a funny view I think of what's going on in Russia. But the, I will just say that there are a lot of Russians who do not agree with this war and who see a different vision for the future of Russia. Um, and I. I'm going to end it there. So Putin has violated, just to summarize, Putin has violated every norm and every law of war. Our current institutions are paralyzed. Um, the imperial ideas of Europe died in the last century and they have not necessarily died for Putin. And I would say that there are probably quite a few Russians who still think that Russia has an imperial right, not only to the former Soviet Union, but also to the former the former Warsaw Pact, right? The, the territory that Russia, that the Soviet Union used to control. Um, but there is this strong feeling in the West that it cannot allow Putin's Russia to achieve victory. And so that, that means the war is going on or unless there's a rapid escalation this spring um, that pushes the Russian lines back. And I'll stop it there, thanks. Thank you, Lise, uh, and thank you to all of our contributors. We've had a number of questions kind of pop into the Q&A, so if you have questions now, you can use the Q&A function, um, some of which uh, the panelists have, have answered in chat, which is fantastic. I want to bring up two questions for you all um, that sort of 
either puzzle me or I feel um, particularly depressed about. Uh, and so I want you to make me feel better. Uh, we'll start with the depressing one, which, which Lise, you alluded a little bit to this. Um, but, but one question that comes to my mind is, and this was uh, reflected in one of our um, one of our questions in the chat, um, what role, if any, is there for a Russian resistance um, to impact the trajectory of this war, whether people are um, unhappy just about the war or dissatisfied more generally? Um, Putin seems like a pretty effective uh, manager of dissent uh, within his own borders. And so I wondered if, if anybody had um, thoughts about that. I know it was talked about a lot at the beginning of the war. Um, I, I hear less about it now. Um, and then uh, another question, uh, and I'll, I'll let you guys uh, sort of think about who wants to answer what, um, uh, response to something um, Jim said earlier about uh, how, how in some ways surprisingly united the West has been in their support. Um, and uh, I guess my questions here are sort of, how quickly uh, do we see that all falling apart uh, if, if it's going to, um, but also, um, why you think that was uh, if you think that was a miscalculation on Putin's part right to to um to think that the um, support would be fragmented and that the west could not coalesce around this um uh, and maybe what i don't know you want to speculate on what Putin's thinking these days but um you know given the last year um what the expectations might be for continued cohesion um or or can you just kind of wait it out shorter or longer term um so so maybe we can address the the um one about Russian resistance first and, and see if anybody has anything cheerful to say. Oh, that was that was easy, very quick. Uh, okay, well, no, 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 I, 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 we're all waiting for each other, but I'll just yeah. say a few things, yeah. right? So um, what we know from Yuri's previous work is that re repression works, right? <laughs> um, and lots of other work, Christian Davenport and others. Uh, so, uh, and and Russian society as a whole has experienced so much historical repression from serfdom to the gulag to now, you know, if you protest the war, you, you can you can land in jail. There was just a story this morning about a, a, a single dad being thrown into jail because his his sixth grader drew a picture, drew an anti-war picture. Um, so you. Um, it, it is dangerous for Russians to resist the war. It puts them, it puts individuals directly at risk. And at the same time, we see somewhere between a half a million and a million Russians have left. I don't, I can't think of any war where the aggressor has had such a huge exodus of people <laughs> um, fleeing conscription, right? Fleeing the possibility of having to fight in the war. So I, I, maybe somebody else, maybe my, maybe Jesse knows from military history, but I don't, I don't, I don't know of an instance of something like that. People are voting with their feet by leaving. Um, so there, there is that, and that also means that resistance is growing outside of Russia to Putin, and you see, you see the opposition coalescing now around a few leaders, the Navalny. Um, documentary has just come out, or well, it came out a little while ago, but it's being reissued now. I would recommend that you check that out. Um, uh, Yuri Dud, D U D, has uh, uh, millions and millions of followers on YouTube. And a lot of his videos are translated, have English subtitles, so you can check those out too. Telekanadosh TV Rain, unfortunately, doesn't have any English language um, uh, broadcasting, so it's hard. To know it's hard for the for Americans to listen to that, but I mean for most for non-Russian speakers anyway. Um, but those that there are opposition figures emerging, there are people um, uh, working together and uniting to try to figure out what might come next in Russia, and that gives me hope, Kathleen. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Lise. Does anybody else want to weigh in on uh, on this one? I think having it be optimistic is is actually a, a politically useful thing in this forum, and it's so easy to pile on pessimism. So I just want to applaud Lisa's answer. I think it's politically useful. Thanks, Jesse. 
How about to our, uh, or my second question about uh, unity and disunity in the West and, and sort of where, why, why Putin didn't see the potential or greater potential for unity and uh, how long that'll keep going. Um, got Jim and Jesse, yeah. Go ahead, Jesse. Well, I, I was gonna say Jim should answer, but um, to buy you time, uh, I think it was really important that the performance of Macron getting humiliated and punked was, I think, uh, easy to lose track of in terms of small scale domestic politics in any of these countries. I spent a lot of time watching the Macron vote very carefully when when uh, the, the Le Pen counterfactual was was looming. You know, like what happens if Le Pen flips and thinking like even if she wins, would she really want to go shake hands with that guy? You know, after what just happened, and and for myself, I mean, we never will really know. But my hunch is the answer is no. My hunch is that after that humiliation, you will lose the ability in Europe to do anything once you are in a photo op with with Vladimir Putin. You you will not be able to do much domestically, and I suspect that goes even for someone like Orban. And so um, there's a, um, I mean, this creates a set of sort of second tier problems that it takes a very brave public intellectual or political leader indeed to be a Russia dove in this situation because there's just, the, the, there's nothing at the table for you. Um, and so there's less creativity than maybe they could be otherwise, but I don't think this is a time where where creativity is is um, the limiting factor. I think, I think most people just want to isolate Vladimir Putin um, and they could see in Macron the possibility of Lucy in the football over and over and over again. And so um, that might go on for, normally that's the sort of thing that you think about, uh, it's only six months from now, we'll see where the next chip in the NATO armor is. But I think this could linger for quite some time um, that no one wants to be the first mover. So that's um, uh, to queue up whatever else Jim is gonna say. <laughs> I, I do think uh, Macron, I think he is Charlie Brown. I mean, I think that, I think if he thought he could be the guy that negotiates some kind of end to this, I think he would be eager to have that opportunity. But there are these huge constraints that Jesse pointed out. Um, uh, but I think in terms of Putin's miscalculation, in my view, both the Russians and the Chinese drank their own Kool-Aid from 2008 on that the US was in decline, the West was in decline, and that they were on the rise. Um, and I think that they really underestimated, uh, both of them, uh, what the West is capable of. And I think, like I said before, I think it really helped that you had an administration in power, in office. Even with the mistakes they made in 2021, and even with their desire not to be involved in Europe like this at all, I mean, they came into office wanting to focus on China. They didn't want this. Um, but, you know, especially because their intelligence, th there's a great Politico oral history that came out um, last week. Uh, and the, you know, interviews with lots of the top uh, U.S. government officials. There's some others as well, but mainly U.S. Uh, on the sort of the run up to the war, the year prior to the war. Uh, the understanding by by the fall um, that something big was going to happen, uh, the ability to to organize, to be ready to have a response, to try to convince others in NATO, to try to convince the Ukrainians that this was coming, um, and I, you know, this was a this is a team of transatlanticists. They they were they by their background they were prepared to do this. Uh, the cautionary note I would sound from on the U.S. side, and uh, Shibley Telhami has done a lot of public opinion work uh, on sort of U.S. attitudes toward the war. He's shown the bipartisan support, but also has shown that Americans have largely been supportive as long as they believe that Ukraine is winning. Or has, and I noticed there was a question in the chat about this and a, and a, and a chance of winning. And that there is a danger that as this continues to bog down, we'll see if there's a Ukrainian offensive later this spring, which I think people are expecting. And I think there is a sense that they sort of have one big chance to try to take back as much territory as they can later this spring. Uh, 
Uh, but then I think it's going to be difficult for the West to maintain the level of support uh, that it's been um, contributing. And uh, the challenge is, uh, I put a piece uh, in response to one of the questions um, in the Q&A, a uh, foreign affairs piece of Bill Dalder and I did in January, um, basically arguing that this is a war that may not end. Um, I, I like, I, Lisa's two by two uh, was great. And, um, you know, I think she laid out the different options quite well. Um, in my view, uh, this uh, especially we've seen frozen conflicts um, elsewhere uh, in the in this neighborhood. Um, I don't think there's going to be a peace agreement. I don't I think you could have a ceasefire. I think you could have some kind of disengagement. I think you could have a less fighting. Um, but I think a state of war will continue to exist between Russia and Ukraine as long as Vladimir Putin's in power. Uh, and so it, it will be hard uh, to, main the, to maintain the unity over a long over the long term, but the miscalculation, in my view, again, key thing is that the Russians and Chinese, the, and you know, Putin watched the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, I don't think he thought the U.S. was capable of this, um, and uh, you know, he's uh, you know, he's now got a military that's been uh, devastated. Thank you both. So uh, on this note of the war potentially not ending, uh, and I think we'll, we'll try to have this be our last point, I'm trying to gather a little bit of what people are asking in the questions here, um, is about uh, escalation versus continued attrition. So I, I think Yuri's presentation is really compelling uh, that we're at a war of attrition at this point without any major changes in, in support. Um, but there are a few questions from the audience about um, the chance for mass atrocities, the chance for nuclear action. Um, how should we think about that as we move forward, uh, you know, as voters, as, as part of the, the public opinion um, in, in, well, whatever publics we're in as international uh, society, um, and what might be done to prevent escalation, um, you know, if, if anything at this stage? Well, I can try this one. Um, so I think the limiting factor here fundamentally is the fact that uh, the Russian military is thoroughly exhausted and it will take many years to rebuild, uh, especially following the disastrous opening months of the campaign uh, when they lost such a high number of uh, highly trained officers uh, who right now could be more useful to them, training the new mobilized recruits, uh, also losing... You know, thousands of armored vehicles, um, both uh, having them destroyed and having them, many of them captured by Ukraine. And right now what we're seeing in the Russian military is that they're not really in much of a position to uh, significantly expand even the scope of the, the offensive that's happening in the, in the Donbass, much less uh, expand out to the Baltic states or, or, or other areas in the current situation. I mean, this may change, but probably not overnight, not this, you know, we're talking years, not months. Because uh, right now, even what they're trying to do, they're reforming while fighting. They're kind of building the plane as they're flying it. If you look at the changes that they're trying to implement right now to command and control, for instance, they're re returning to this traditional military district command and control structure, uh, shifting away from you know, their reliance earlier on the war on these regulars like LNR, DNR militias, uh, and trying to integrate uh, some of these militias into the main Russian army. This is one of the consequences of annexation is now these militias are are now going to be integrated into the command structure. And this is creating a lot of friction on the ground. Um, many of these units are not trained or equipped to professional standards. They're not very effective on the battlefield. Uh, they pretty much always required reinforcements from the conventional Russian military. And right now, uh, they're doing two things. They're purging the leadership of these units. They're also um, putting Russian mobilized personnel under the command of LNR and DNR commanders, which is creating a lot of friction. And over the past week, I've seen a lot of these mobilized personnel complain openly that they're being used as cannon fodder, that uh, they're being mistreated. Uh, there's also large changes that, to Russian force structure that the Russians are trying to implement right now. They've pretty much abandoned at this point this whole battalion tactical group concept. They've been deploying and fighting more normal doctrinal formations and units. Uh, this is kind of a shift away after mobilization. They've shifted away from the uh, ship toward uh, uh, an approach that they think is going to prepare them to fight a protracted war. So they're viewing this as a multi-year, potentially multi-decade horizon. Uh, 
Uh, and so most of the, the downstream risks that we're talking about right now are not going to materialize probably for many years. And this is, they're very much playing the long game here. And as regards nuclear weapons, um, so here there's a problem that Russia's declaratory nuclear, nu nuclear deterrence policy is in, intentionally ambiguous. And this has opened up a lot of speculation. That, so this is all this talk about escalate to de-escalate this idea of compelling war termination through the early use of nuclear arms. Uh, and Russia does have a strategy for limited nuclear use, but it's not, it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? So they have different approaches for different types of conflicts. So for a local war, like a limited conflict with a smaller state like Ukraine or Georgia is a, is a different approach than what they would take for a regional war, uh, though it can be a, a European war against NATO versus a large scale war, with multiple theaters or regions that would be basically what we would call World War III. Um, and Russia expects a great power war between nuclear peers to eventually evolve nuclear weapons. But the Russian military does not believe that limited nuclear use necessarily leads to uncontrolled escalation. Uh, they think it may have a decisive deterrent effect. So like, think of it like a game of chicken, right? So in a limited or regional war, uh, according to Russian doctrine, nuclear use would be mainly demonstrative. Uh, here we're talking about non-strategic nuclear weapons, you know, this theater level. Uh, employment of nuclear, nuclear weapons against critical infrastructure, sparsely populated areas. Basically, the goal here is to compel the enemy to stop, right? And uh, this generates psychological pressure on elites and population of the targeted state. Uh, and and also, frankly, if they're if the Russians are going to do this, they'll probably also blame the U.S. Uh, at least domestically. Um, they've already, they've already been, been talking about this on uh, on state TV, uh, and uh, you know, just as their official claim announced that the U.S. pushed. Ukraine into starting a war against Russia, they're going to try to blame any potential first nuclear use on either a provocation by the US or on something else. And this is not a story that anyone outside of Russia is going to buy. This is mainly going to be for domestic consumption. But in terms of their expectations of a US response, uh, they believe that the US has an escalation dilemma, right? that they think the US has much lower interests at stake and is unlikely to extend deterrence to distant allies like Ukraine. Uh, but I think the, the more fundamental problem is there a lack of uh, I mean, potential targets in Ukraine. I mean, you, you can think of things that they might target as part of this tactical nuclear use. I mean, there's non-nuclear power plants, there's administrative centers, civilian airports, roads, uh, rail bridges, ports, uh, components of the defense industrial complex, you know, sources of mass media and information, command and control centers, space-based assets, key communication nodes. The problem is, like, they're already targeting all this stuff with conventional weapons. Uh, the, all, all these things have already been targeted as part of their strike campaign over the fall. Uh, it has not made a huge impact. Um, and, the, and, and the main impact of using tactical nuclear weapons against these same targets is that this has a much greater risk of escalation on the U.S. side than, uh, than things, things that they've employed so far. So it's not clear what, what benefit they will gain from, from this type of approach unless they really have their back pushed against the wall uh, their military is completely a spent force and they have no levers to pull other than the nuclear button. But I think that's, that's pretty much the end game and we're a long way away from that right now given where things are. Yeah, great. Thank you, Yuri. Um, we are right at our time. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us today. It's a really fantastic discussion. Uh, and to our audience uh, for participating and joining in. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Kathleen and Idine. Thank you, everyone.